Hi, everyone. Uh, thanks for joining us to talk about everyone's natural favorite character, Theon Greyjoy. <laughs> All right, uh, I'm Petra Halber. I write for Watchers on the Wall. My name is Lisa Spinago, and I am here just because I love Theon. <laughs> I'm Luca Nieto, I also write for Watchers, and I'm mainly here to see Petra freak out about Theon. <laughs> I am Michael, uh, also known as Bookshelf Stud. I do podcasts, and I, you know, I have complicated feelings about Theon. Right. Well, I'm glad you, you, that's how you introduced yourself, because I thought we could start out by just explaining, you know, Theon is a polarizing character, and so we could just take a second to talk about why each of us felt drawn enough to the character to sit on a panel all about him. Um, I'll, I'll go last, out of humility. I mean, I, I, Theon is just, there's a lot going on in his character, and a lot of it has to do with some of the really big ideas at the core of Game of Thrones and Song of Ice and Fire. And so I think he's just a really interesting character to read. Um, even if he, you know, may do some questionable moral things um, at some points. And then obviously the transformation he undergoes is just, I mean, it's, it's uh, staggering and it's, it's one of the uh, most compelling things, I think, about Song of Ice, Fire and Game of Thrones is, is that character transformation. So, it, yeah, I just, I, I think he's fascinating. You could go on forever about him. So. You have an hour. <laughs> oh. <laughs> For me, it's mostly about, about that transformation and the fact that he may be the... Uh, we were talking about this earlier, like, he's one of the characters with, with a, uh, the, probably the most complex character arc in the whole show. So, uh, I think that's basically it, yeah. For me, um, I came to uh, this whole series first reading all the books and then not really liking Theon at all but then seeing Alfie Allen's portrayal and the way he was written and some of the twists that, that come for the character that are different in the series really brought Theon to life and his complexity and the sympathy that I, I had for him was kind of awakened partly by the writing in the series, but also by, as I said, the, the excellent portrayal that Alfie Allen brought and I, I'm actually an actor, and I, I love this character. <laughs> Very complicated. I, um, I was intrigued by how complicated he was early on, but I didn't become a Theon fan, per se, until the Reek chapters. Or I got to the Reek chapters in A Dance with Dragons and Reek in season four, more or less at the same time. And I was just intrigued by... I'd never encountered a sympathetic, brainwashed lackey before, and I'd never read, I'd never read it from the perspective of the lackey in the books, and I, it was sheer fascination with the character and, and sympathy, but it was sort of the, the, the novelty of such a concept that really, um, really got me interested in the character, and it was Reek who made me a hardcore Game of Thrones fan. So I was pretty, it took me a while to actually become one of the, the diehards, but it really was Theon Greyjoy's storyline that upgraded me from casual fan to convention attendee. So it was all, it was a bit, uh, a lot of things happened at once for me. Um, and we, we've kind of touched on this a little bit, but public sentiment about Theon remains mixed, but generally the, the arc has been from hatred to sympathy. In season two, pretty universally, people did not like him. And now in season seven, you know, people were generally had a positive response to that, you know, his victory in that beach fight scene. So it's this amazing shift in public sentiment. Was there a particular point, plot point moment in the books or the show where you felt that start to shift? And if you have a different history with the character, what, what was it? Actually, uh, can I start with asking everyone in the audience, do you like Theon? Who, who likes Theon? <laughs> who thinks he's cool? Who hates Theon? Who? Okay, second. Right. That's a good question. <laughs> who hates Theon? <laughs> Thank you for being here anyways. A couple of you. You're very honest. Thank you. Thank you very much. So y your question, Petra, was when did we feel that the 
our, our feelings for Theon started to turn, possibly? Yeah, like, was there a moment where you went, oh, this is not how I expected to feel? For me, it was a show-only moment, which is when he burned, well, he wrote, uh, he was about to write a letter and send a letter to Rob to warn him about his father's plans, and he burned it. So that's when I realized that he was a pretty compl complex character. For me, it was at the King's Moot when he decided at that point that he was going to really be supportive of his sister, truly. Um, I th I, it felt like it was a character. I mean, I was very interested and invested in him, but I really was much more invested in him at, after that point, kind of later on. I would say that, um, at least in the show, there's a scene, I think it was in season three, where before we know who Ramsey is, he and Theon escape together, and they're breaking back into the dread fort, unbeknownst to our poor maligned Theon. Um, and Theon has a great monologue about Ned, his, his true father, and, and all these really <clears throat> very raw emotions um, that, yeah, you wouldn't expect from a character who up until that point had been, I mean, in season two, he was, he was sympathetic, but kind of a laughable villain in some ways, like with the horn blowing and all that. You know, it, it was, he was kind of pathetic. But then that, that moment, that, that monologue, right before everything gets snatched out from under him, um, that, yeah, that, that really turned it around for me anyway, at least in the show, in the show. I think that in the books, he's generally more of a little shit. Like... <laughs> he commits worse crimes. Yeah. Like he is a, his, his tally list is longer. And he's much, for a while at least, he's much more unrepentant about uh, betraying Rob. Well, and that's another thing um, that I find interesting about book versus show Theon is, I mean, I'll, I'll be honest, um, I think his arc is better written in the show, to be honest, which it's a contentious, you know, opinion to have, but the fact that he, I, I never really feel like he actually regrets that he's actually sorry in the in the books. Um, there's a point where he's, I think he's talking to one of the, the washerwomen, and she says, you know, you've, um, you're, you're a kinslayer, and he says, no, I didn't kill my brothers, and he means he, he killed peasants, not his foster brothers, and she's thinking he means, you know, the biological distinction. And he says, look, I've committed terrible crimes, but I've been punished for it. And I'm like, you don't get to make that call, dude. Like, you don't get to be like, I've suffered adequately for my war crimes and I get to move on, and I'm like, I don't, it really irks me, and I like that in the show, he, he really is like, no, I, I can't undo what I've done, I feel horrible, I, I'm doing my best to move forward, but he actually, actually feels sorry, and I feel like his, his um, quote-unquote redemptive acts actually relate to that, like holding Sansa under the fallen tree, like actually taking the time to, 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 hold somebody, like physically to, to offer them warmth is a, is a uh, empathetic action that he never really has in the books. Well, in the books, though, he, his, uh, a lot of his story just stops. He's very far advanced now, I guess, by necessity, because <laughs> the show is like speeding along to its conclusion, mm -hmm. and we don't know, in a way, what... He's diverged from the book Theon. He's advanced, he's, his, the plot in and of itself with him has just gone way farther. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I do wonder, and I, I don't wanna you know, go on too much of a tangent about the winds of winter, but it was gonna come up eventually. Um, but I do wonder, like in the show, we obviously, we have Theon through season three, four, five, six, but in the books, we're only reintroduced to him in book five, so I wonder if we're going to get some more of what we've seen in the show, but sort of at a different, pace in the story, you know, this, this sort of more redemptive or, or uh, uh, I don't know, sorrowful over his actions, Theon, that we see in the show that might come up later. This is an interesting point, um, and, and not, and <laughs> you're welcome, but, but, but not one, it, it's really truly speculative, because what is going to happen with the next books, we have no idea, <laughs> and we don't know. Is he going? Is George R. R. Martin going to follow the show? Is he going to path, you know, branch off into a new path? Maybe kind of spitefully. <laughs> um, <laughs> did he give 
Weiss and Benioff, the, the outline pop, plot points of what's going to happen at the end of the show, and then now he's coming up with something different. <laughs> um, is Theon going to be, and, and I only bring this up in the context of the fact, is Theon going to be very different the sh in the end, the show Theon versus the book Theon? Are they going to be completely, almost completely different? Are they going to have different endings? We don't know. George Martin is famously like, uh, he considers himself a, a gardener, not an architect. So I'm sure he gave uh, the showrunners like an outline, but then when he actually gets to write that part, it's, it's obviously going to change a lot. So well, there are going to be a lot of differences, I imagine. I guess, you know, a little um, off topic slightly, but last night I was talking to various people here and a couple of people were saying, well, maybe he is spiteful. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe he's going to do something really different. We don't know. He can do that. They're his characters. Yeah. I think um, just to, with getting back to Theon specifically, um, there's been a lot of, you know, George R. R. Martin and consequently the show enjoy creating parallels. And there are quite a lot of parallels between John and Theon in how they were raised in particular. And yet, of course, they branched off to be drastically different people. What do you think fundamentally is different between John and Theon? We talked about this earlier, but for, for everyone else. Well, Michael, why don't you answer that question? Because I'm just curious. Well, I mean, they, they both do Although they were both raised in Winterfell, one of them was uh, glorified prisoner of war. Um, not really, I mean, you know, it's different from a modern prisoner of war, but, you know, for all intents and purposes, a, a hostage. Whereas John, while he wasn't a true-born son of Ned Stark and, you know, didn't enjoy maybe the same privileges as Rob, um, certainly would have... Uh, enjoyed a better status than Theon, I think, uh, just growing up. And personally, I think John found solace in that he thought he was uh, Ned's actual son, while uh, Theon remembered his family. And from a, I think we mentioned that earlier, like from a, from a child's point of view, so he's a, he idealizes the, the great joys a bit. And when he arrives in season two, book two, like, He's acting as a, as a child, like a child. And, and Theon and, and John, while they both came to um, the Starks in a similar age, there, there is a kind of a, a difference between them in age, but um, Theon was not a bastard. Theon was a political hostage, and uh, Theon knew that he had another family, and he idolized, he idealized them and idolized them, but also he always has, he has a terrible father complex. He has so much to prove. He's so rejected by his father. This drives so many bad decisions. <laughs> um, and, and it makes a big difference between him and John. I mean, John, even though he's a bastard, does know that, at least to his mind, as far as he knows, he does have a father. To me, the fundamental difference between John and Theon is John came to Winterfell as a baby and Theon came to Winterfell as a child. And that, um, that fundamentally changes your relationship to where you live. That John didn't have it the, the best. He didn't have a, a loving mother figure, but that was all he ever knew. And so he has an affection for Winterfell that Theon it never quite has in the same way. Um, John thinks of the other Stark children as his siblings, for better or worse. Theon, in the books, explicitly, you know, thinks to himself that that's never how he saw them. And so to, you know, and this is one of those topics where I can genuinely get a little bit, like, Theon apologetic, apologist and get, like, stroppy about it. But the, the, the idea that the Starks were... Theon's true family, which a lot of people, especially show viewers only, think, oh, well, Theon betrayed his family. And I'm like, he, he, he really didn't. Not, not in that, not, not in the way that, that you think. Um, because, yeah, coming to a new place when you're eight years old under traumatic circumstances is going to lead to a different kind of development than if you show up as a baby. And I, I want to add to that, too, that... Um 
in the books, for sure, we see Theon and John um, both thinking about being the Lord of Winterfell and, mm -hmm. you know, sort of projecting themselves into that role. And for Theon, that means violently overthrowing Winterfell and, and making it a Greyjoy thing, but now Winterfell is his. Um, and he gets the best of both worlds. Whereas for John, it's um, particularly at the end of book five, I think, about that Stark heritage and about that, you know, that connection through Ned Stark. Whereas for Theon, it's this really kind of warped, um, well, I love Winterfell, but also I'm a Greyjoy, so I need to tear down all the Stark stuff and make it a Greyjoy place. So it, it's, a, it's this really different um, idea of what it means to be the good lord of Winterfell. And what, what is interesting motivation for Theon? Theon wants desperately to be a prince, to be a king, to be the king of the Iron Islands. He thinks that's just going to automatically happen through heritage, and he's sadly mistaken. <laughs> but, uh, and John does not want to be a king, but he ends up being a king. He ends up being reluctantly the king of the north. And when Theon and John meet again in the the series, their fortunes are reversed, and John is a king, and Theon is really not a king. <laughs> so it did not at all go the way that either of them planned. I honestly hadn't noticed those parallels uh, probably until they met again, like, and they're made pretty clear, like uh, w w when they have that conversation in the in the Dragonstone throne room. That's probably one of my favorite scenes from season seven. And I think um, the fact that John validates him is I I Im important personally, obviously, for just my own catharsis, but I, I think it's an important plot point that Theon get that from the closest, the closest thing still living to Ned Stark. But it's interesting you were talking about like both of them aspiring to be the king or the prince of Winterfell, and John is kind of the quintessential reluctant leader which is not an archetype that I'm personally fond of, but John handles it well. But it is interesting because I don't, like Theon is power hungry, but fundamentally I don't think. Um, I think he's acceptance hungry. Well, that's it, but I think he, can, he only thinks he can achieve that through obtaining power. Like Daenerys, for example, is, um, and I, I don't mean this in a, in a negative way necessarily, but she is power hungry. She wants to rule. Like she has, I don't want to turn this into a Daenerys panel, but she, she has aspirations that are specifically related to Theon, ruling. And Theon wants a home. Theon was raised to believe that power for him equates to acceptance. Yes. Um, for being ironborn and being born into that family, if he's the king, then he automatically gets acceptance and then that becomes his home. And that all is one piece as far as he's concerned. It's not the same for the rest of the characters. Yeah. What their approach to what power means and what they want out of it. And I think it's interesting that, um, you know, he, he, seems, I, I, he, he seems happiest at the end of season seven. That's the happiest we've seen him in a long time. I mean, he's like barely conscious and his face is covered in blood. <laughs> but that's actually pretty good for him, all things considered. Yeah. That's an upgrade. Um, <laughs> but he, it, it's funny that that's a role he says, not for me, for Yara. That it's, you know, he um, has this good moment and it's quite explicitly not him in a position of power. It's him serving someone else, serving a woman of all things. And that's so... You know, he's at his most conflicted and unhappy when he's the Prince of Winterfell, which by all external standards is a pretty good position to be in. And he's at his most, um, I won't say happy, but content when he's supporting someone else, which I, I, think, has, I, I think that really speaks to his relationship to what he fundamentally wanted. It's not power, it's you know, that, that sense of connection with somebody. Well, that, that raises a question for me. Uh, this goes back to a point that kind of surprised me, and I think that was a point that maybe was a little startling and led to some fandom division. It's what did everyone think of, of Theon's reaction to his uncle taking um, Yara? And, and his jumping overboard. <laughs> what, were, what was your opinion about that when you saw it? What do you think now? I cried. A lot of people judged him, <laughs> and I get it. But 
he was pretty obviously like triggered with PTSD. Like uh, it, he wasn't himself at the time. Like he reverted to Rick, and uh, you don't. Uh, I, I think since he's a psychopath and uh, a sadist, not, not unlike Ramsey, I think that there, uh, yeah. there, there wasn't any other option. <laughs> yeah, I, I mean, from a storytelling point of view, I liked it just because uh, it's. It's always refreshing when something doesn't turn out the way you expect, I think. That, that's something that draws us all to A Song of Ice Fire, I'm sure. But so, you know, when, when the hero is confronted with this kind of hostage situation, for him to, like, just dive overboard, that, that, was, that was cool because that was interesting and that was a little unexpected. Although it definitely made sense for Theon. Yeah. And that's why it kind of worked, I think, in that, in that sense. Even though I am, I'm fond of the character, I was irritated at first when I first saw it. That was my first reaction, but then I, I understood. I mean, I, I truly did understand, you know, psychologically, or I understood, you know, rationally, that's a, a, a PTSD reaction. But in a sense, emotionally, I thought, well, what is he doing? Why is he doing that? Stop, I, stop doing that. When I first watched it and he started twitching, I started crying and I looked down and I didn't look up until I saw him jump overboard. And it was this, like, I was getting emotional, and I look up, I just see his little body just hurl itself overboard. I was like, what, what the fuck? But, what? but I, um, I don't know if we're allowed to swear on these things. Yeah. All, right, all right, cool. Um, and it, it was really interesting in the, the week afterwards, typically when professionals weigh in on Game of Thrones, it's usually like, it's a fantasy show, let's not overthink it. Like, sure, everyone would have died of infection by this point. Like, it's, it's fine. <laughs> But, but it was very interesting. People who either professionally or from personal experience know about PTSD triggers were like, no, 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 that's actually what happens. Like, that's not an armchair diagnosis. That's an actual, apparently accurate portrayal of what happens. That, so, so other people better informed on the topic have told me. And I think that's, that's quite extraordinary for Game of Thrones to, to bring in. Well, well it, it's interesting for any fantasy. Is this is what, one of the things, well, I was talking to everybody beforehand. Um, when I started reading Game of Thrones, was very reluctantly because I actually don't like fantasy. <laughs> I have an admission to make. <laughs> but what I do like about fan, uh, Game of Thrones is, is that there's a, a tremendous uh, sense of reality to it. And th this yeah. is one of the components. You know, uh, I think a lot of fantasy stories, people would be suffering from PTSD. Yeah. <laughs> There's so much violence and, and nastiness in fantasy stories. Yeah. You were gonna... yeah, I was going to say that uh, in terms of Theon and in that situation with Yara and Euron, uh, let's be fair, like, let's, let's just imagine that, that, he wasn't, that he didn't suffer an episode. Mm -hmm. What should he have done? Like, if he, if he got one step closer, Jada would have died. So, yeah. in the end, it wasn't that bad. I, I made that point to my dad when I watched it with him, because he was cursing and swearing at Theon <laughs> yeah. afterwards. And I was like, but realistically, what would he have done? My dad was like, look, it's that sort of fantasy situation where you, sh you, you swashbuckle on board and you save the lady, and that's just kind of what happens. You don't jump off the ship. And I was like... <laughs> Not in Game of Thrones. <laughs> I, well, yeah, that's, I mean... So the, the practicality of him jumping overboard is, is true, but that's also like, that's not why he did it. Of course not. But... Um, and I, I like, I, in season six, I really liked the, uh, the, I had conflicted feelings about the brothel scene with him and Yara, where she does her best to help him, but fundamentally she's trying to cure PTSD with ale and a pep talk. And that's love. Tough love, yeah, yeah, and that, that is how she means it, but I, I took it as the show being like, he's better now. Like, the imperious curse has been lifted, he's fine. And Alfie Allen, uh, sneaky bastard, said in an interview, uh, oh, in season, uh, season seven, Theon has let go of Reek, he's moved past Reek. So I was going in fully expecting, like, it's all over now and he's Theon now. So when they actually brought it back and gave it consequences, I was like, I didn't... I really didn't expect that. Like, they actually doubled down on the, their character setup. So the Volantis seemed like uh, improved ret retroactively. 
for you? Yeah, because I think it says more about Yara than it says about Theon. If, if you view it as um, the scene in which Theon, you know, snaps out of it and is fine, if you see that as the scene in which Theon heals, then it's a terrible scene. But if you see it as uh, a scene in which Yara tries to help her mentally ill brother the only way she knows how, then it's a great scene. Yeah, that, that's basically what I wanted to contribute there was that it, it, at the time I was like, yeah, is the show trying to portray this as healthy? But I think, yeah, I, I think, yeah you're right. Him jumping off the ship kind of actually uh, embiggens the greatness of that moment a little bit yeah. because it's, it's more about yeah, right, this, uh, you know relationship that isn't working. Well, it also adds to his complexity and it lengthens the time that we're going to be interested in him because he did something weird and he did something that makes sense within his character, but it is kind of like a weird thing in a drama for, for someone struck into a, the typical heroic position to suddenly run away. Um, but that does make it interesting, and that's something more to follow up on. So what's going to happen now? What happens next? Well, that is an interesting question. What, what are your your thoughts on it, b book and show. I think we're mostly talking about the show at this point, but if you have thoughts about the book, what are your, your mm. hopes slash predictions? Because I know what I want, but I am not about to think that that's what will happen. I like to, I, I like him to uh, live happy, uh, happily ever after and regrow his dick, <laughs> but that's not going to happen. So. He goes to Wakanda, and sure, he fixes another broken white boy. <laughs> oh, that's good. I like that. Okay. With, uh, Fan it's fiction writers, I'll give you my vibrating email. vibrating capabilities. Yeah, Sorry? With, with vibrating capabilities. Oh, God. <laughs> Wakanda, the new place where everyone with PTSD can heal. Yay! <laughs> but what I actually think will happen... <laughs> I think he will probably save or help save his sister. Though I think I, pre I prefer Yara to kill Euron, personally. Me too. Oh. I think the, their, their enmity is, is, the enmity with Euron is more with Yara than with, than with Theon. And I don't even know what Euron's been doing with, with Yara all this time, but I mean, just by how he is, like, he probably deserves it. Uh, you so, have so this is in the show. That's what. Yeah, you sure. Want. I mean, the books. The last time we saw him, he had just like jumped off a wall. So I, I don't even know. Yeah, I mean, I I I put the most thought I think into his his endgame in the books because we've been kind of at the same place with Theon for seven years now. So we we kind of know. You know, there's been plenty of time to ruminate on it. Um, I, what I would like in the books is for him to help Yara become Queen of the Iron Islands and then like settle down, open up a crab shack or something, <laughs> like just hang out. Um, I, I don't know if I see him surviving the books all the way. I, I would like him to. Um, I think he'll survive past like where we are right now in the books, past sort of like this cliffhanger with him and Stannis and Asha, not Yara. Um, Yarasha. Um, <laughs> as for the show, I think he's going to die. That's what I think. Controversially. I, I think he's going to get like maybe a, a noble sort of death, but I, I don't know. I don't know that I feel optimistic about, about my boy Theon. I think he's going to die, but <laughs> I think he's going to die saving Jared. Uh Yeah, I think that's pretty much what's going to be happening. If it's in the cards for him is that he will have the redemptive arc of death, saving his sister who will go on to be the queen. Um, and in the books, I'd like to have at least something match up with what's happened on the television show for him, or not for him to just disappear in the books, yeah. like being irrelevant. Uh, but as I said, who knows what's on George R. R. Martin's mind? I, I don't. I wish I did. I, I, it would be nice. I could make a lot of money that way, telling people. I, um, again, this isn't a prediction. It's what I want. Either Theon and, this is the show, Theon and Yara to die together or Theon and Yara to both live. But, but both live, 
I, I like this idea of her somehow not being quite whole afterwards. Um, it, it would be interesting if Euron cut out her tongue, just because that's Ugh. a thing. I, I don't. I'm not. I don't want this to happen. Yeah. I'm just. Oh, <laughs> ew. But but I like the idea of. If, if they form a dynamic where they're two broken people who have to depend on each other, I like that concept. Um, or they get a scene in which they drown together. I would, I'm thinking um, Sun and Jen's death from Lost. Do you remember that? Where they, they, they and then they. You are a very happy person. <laughs> it's, we're wow. at a Game of Thrones convention. Where do you think you are? Wow. Like, Good point. I'm you, not okay. Crab Shack is a great concept. That's great. If that happens, I'll be very happy. But like, provided that maybe that doesn't happen, I think the symbolism of Theon and Yara not being, or at least I would really love it if Theon um, finds Yara and you know maybe she's not doing so well, and so he he comes up to her and has to really say like, no, I'm Theon, I'm Theon, and he says, don't die so far from the sea. And that's his way of kind of getting her back. All right. Now, I imagine her on a boat, so that wouldn't actually make sense. But I like that concept of, you know, she, she found him when he was broken. I, I like the idea of him helping her with her brokenness. I like that idea of two people kind of helping each other. And with his, ex and then his they experience of brokenness. I, that's what, yeah, so exactly. They, so they help each other and then they drown. Like I mean, the Titanic, <laughs> the ship goes down very dramatically. If, oh God, if one of them winds up on a door, they better share. <laughs> they better, can you imagine if one of them freezes? Oh God, be all, they have to rotate like five minute increments and then they switch. We can't do that again. <laughs> oh, <laughs> and, oh. Then, and then a zombified Hodor holds the door up for them. <laughs> yes, together. that's the ending. Yay. All right. <laughs> Should we do questions or not for a while? Uh, yeah, we have a little under 15 minutes left. Any fan thoughts? I have a question for the audience. Um, just show of hands, who uh, thinks that Theon, back in book and season two, should have stuck with the Starks? All right. How many people think Theon should have stuck with the Greyjoys? Oh, oh wow. <laughs> yeah. All right. For the record, Alfie said Greyjoys, so... I am canonically correct in my opinion. <laughs> oh, well, good. <laughs> um, yeah, any thoughts? Yep. Uh, just kind of going back to your earlier topic about book Theon versus show Theon. Uh, book Theon is far more uh, destroyed than show Theon. Mm. Uh, after years of torture and being sacrificed to his favorite toy, he's missing all sorts of other parts. We talk about how he can't ride, how he can't draw a bow. I think that heroics don't have to be physical. Like I, I don't think we'll see something like the the fight in the beach, but that's a very movie-like scene. Like that's a very vis a visualization of a of a conflict. Uh, so no, I don't think we'll see him fight and do cool stuff. But I think we'll get some of the same themes as in the show. And I think he, he will sur survive at least for a while in the books, too. I don't think he'll, like, die in the snow. <laughs> yeah. I think... Oh, oh. No, go ahead. I've oh. spoken enough. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, I mean, I think in the books, cer certainly you're right. Like, yeah, he, he can't draw a bow. That's a huge thing because book one, he's like a hunter. He's always smiling. He has a bow, and he likes to ride his horse. And his horse burns to death. Uh, Ramsey cuts off his fingers and punches out his teeth. You know, so he's three for three. Um, four for four, if the implication in the books is, or the thing in the show is true in the books as well. Um, but he is also, 
we've, we've talked about him as like a lord and a prince and, and these kind of identity things. And I think that's where he's going in the books is a question of what he's going to do personally with this status that he has because he's actually very crucial to uh, Asha maybe overthrowing Euron through some um, ironborn legal code uh, fine print. Um, so, so it, uh, his choices in that regard, I think he can still be pretty heroic, and, and he's probably going to have some really interesting conversations. But as for, yeah, I, I agree. Like, the beach fight definitely was a visualization of, of conflict, like you said. It wasn't, um, we're not getting that in the books for sure. Yeah. Were you referring to the Theon the Lightcomer theory when you talked about the fine print? I was, yeah. So for those not in the know real quick, um, there is an ancient Ironborn legend um, about a king's moot that happened. The number one heir was out of town at a crab shack. Um, another guy comes in, it, you know, is declared king. The real heir shows up and the Ironborn rally around him, depose the bad king and name this guy as a king. And because he wasn't at the first king's moot, the, the king's moot was declared invalid. The idea being that in the books, Theon is not at the king's moot, so that king's moot isn't valid, um, which could come up later. Might be an important thing. Because there's a point in, I think, Feast, where Asha is talking to her uh, bookworm uncle, and she brings up Torgon the Latecomer, and she's kind of going, oh, yeah, like, that's an interesting thing. And George likes to drop those little hints to bring them back later. And so it does make sense for me. I don't know how game Theon would be for that, but it does seem like something that Asha would at least try and either find out that her brother is not really capable of that or we get a weird puppet king situation where Ash is the one in control and Theon is the, the uh, marionette. Yeah. Lovingly, but, you know, still. Uh, I know that people don't like to, like, theorize about the books uh, from what's happening in the show, but I think that it's telling that they bothered to do the king's mood. Mm. But what I think they did in the show is, like adapt two different kinsmoods, the one we, we got in the book and the one that's coming, right, the one you mentioned. So I think that, you know, they did it in the same scene, basically. Oh, interesting. Sure. So like, like one king's moot in the book later where Theon will back Yara. Yeah, because uh, e e e even though Yara in the show loses the king's moot, she still gets like a lot of allies and an enormous uh, fleet out of nowhere. That would be really cool if we get you know, kind of like you said, like Theon's arc, but later on where he kind of gives up his need for power and kind of accepts that what he really needs is, you know, to, to, to support his sister. Because um, I, I do like the King's Moot in the show. Um, I, it was kind of, I feel like if you combine that with the book, King's Moot, you get the perfect King's Moot. Like you get political nuance and interpersonal development and you kind of get the politics in the book and the interpersonal stuff in the show. But I... Um, that would be interesting if we kind of get that, but just at a later date. Do you have predictions? Uh, not, it's hard for me to, to imagine what is going to be happening, both in the book, mainly because it's, I don't trust George anymore. <laughs> but, but also, um, I know what I would like to see. As I said, I would like to see Theon come back in a way that is similar to the, the series and, and treated well to the point that at least he's important. Um, that would be for the book, for the series, also difficult because I'm well aware of the fact that they have so many characters and so many things to wrap up all together in a short period of time. It's always like, what can they get to and what will happen? And will they give some of these plot lines a short shrift only because they just don't have the time? Um, do you think something, Bran has been keeping tabs on Theon in the book in the form of a werewood and the form of a raven. Do you think, do you have any sense of where that might go? I mean, um, I, there's plenty of ideas out there, including, so at the end of book five and beginning of book six from the chapters we have of it, he's sort of being set up as maybe a possible sacrifice at a weirwood tree, um, Theon is. And so I think it's possible that Bran could save him um, through some sort of magical gesture, like, I don't know, the tree intercepts the sword, or a bunch of ravens, like, grab the dude's hand who has the sword, or whatever. Um, so I, I would like to see that get resolved a little bit, because obviously um, Theon killed Bran, so it would be interesting to see Bran 
<laughs> interact with Theon at all at this point. Mm. Um, Any more questions? There's a, uh, there's a mic here oh, if you, you want. Do you have a question? You mean after he came to the Starks? Yeah. I mean, in the books, it's pretty clear that n no one, I mean, he thinks to himself that no one did, that, that Ned uh, occasionally tried to be fatherly, but he always kept his distance because he knew he might have to kill him. In the show... It's a bit more ambiguous, I think. Yeah, he has a, a nicer relationship with the Starks. He has a good relationship with Rob. Throw. Which is the sad part, you know, because he betrays Rob. So, yes, but he really does. Uh, Rob, who is in some ways the most honorable of all the characters, the cleanest, you know, most honorable character, which leads to his problems, some, his own problems, um, yeah. is the one who is most supportive of Theon. Yeah. I, I think something could be said about Roz to some degree. Because they do, he is paying her, of course, and uh, she demands payment. But I, I do think it's interesting that, especially in the in the show, he only solicits prostitutes. Where in the books, he kind of gets around with a lot of married women. But I, I think it's it's there's something very sad about a, a person who can only get physical intimacy by paying for it. And I think they do develop this. He doesn't want to pay her uh, in that that very enjoyable scene in season one. And I kind of take that as almost, I don't know, like a very, he doesn't want to pay her, and he, he tries to get her not to go to King's Landing. And those are two very roundabout ways of expressing affection. It's mean, he is hor disrespectful to her, but I do think that that's like the closest thing to um, affection that he finds. They do have a good dynamic, and he... Um, I don't think he has the emotional maturity to even understand that he has some uh, connection to her, but I'm just saying the, the things that he asks of her are the things that you would ask of somebody that you cared about. If that's not oversaying it so too much. So we only have a few minutes left before we have to go. Um, any final thoughts? That would, be, that would be, especially in the show, one hell of a callback. <laughs> I would love it if, in season eight, he's on a ship that has a female captain, and the, the female captain, preferably played by the same woman, has like a five-year-old kid, and they don't, they don't ignore, or maybe she knows she recognizes him and he doesn't or something, but they just kind of have a little where he's like polite to her and he doesn't recognize her, and you kind of get the little moment of like, Oh, holy shit. But, but it's never actually spoken of. Theon being now unable to, which I, I assume that's why you asked, that, right. be, being unable to have children, mm -hmm. uh, his, uh, his status as a, as a prince is a bit, you know. Mm -hmm. So if he has already had children, like that fixes that. He can actually create a legacy. I mean, he needs someone to pass on the yeah, crab exactly. shack too. So I would, I would hope that. Um, I mean, I, I think it's, I think it's possible. I, I'll throw my uh, uh, guarded opinion out there that I think when George was planning on doing a five-year gap in the books to split, to split the books up, that maybe he had that in mind as like something that could come up. But now that there's less time that's elapsed, I don't know if he's gonna. If he, if he would keep that in. Um. I think that would be a lovely idea. It's, it's curious to see whether or not they could even fit that in into the series. And honestly, if I was the, that mother, like I wouldn't give that child to Theon. No. I mean, Theon is a better person now, but he was such an asshole to her, so. Yeah. Uh, yeah, that I was a horrible him. thing. Like, I felt so bad for her. Try smiling like, close your, your, your mouth. Yeah. It's such a, so slimy. Uh, we probably have time for one more question. Can we get someone from over here? Uh, you? No, um, yeah, you. So, Theon, here, here. All right. <laughs> Is there any holdout chance that he gets some sweet, sweet Northern justice coming to him? I think that officially, by the end of season seven, like, John pretty much absolves him. Like, yeah. John said he was okay. Just 
okay. And he's the king in the north. That's, that's the I don't know about the books. Are you talking about a swift, painless execution? <laughs> no, when you say northern justice, that is what northern justice is. I mean, to, in the north, he was tortured and his genitals were chopped off. Like, if we're talking about, like, <laughs> that happened in the north and it happened by a northerner. Like, not for the same reason, but, like, the same body parts were cut off. Like, that's pretty, like... That, that's a lot of justice right there. <laughs> I mean, I, I think there's a non-zero chance that, like, uh, like a mountain clansman or something goes rogue. Um, but in terms of a story perspective, I, I think he, Theon has more to do before, uh, you know... Northern extra number five uh, just sneaks up behind him and cuts his throat or whatever. Um, I, I mean, it's possible, yeah. I guess. I, I think in the in the books, I think in the show, he's pretty much absolved. Um, but in the in the books, I think it's likely that he's going to continue to have to face the consequences. But the likelihood of him getting, I mean, he's he has suffered in the north, but uh, like an actual merciful execution that the northerners just define as, as mercy or justice, I, that seems extraneous to his arc at this point. That that, of all the ways he could die, that seems um, not like the, the most fitting death for I, his arc. I think arc. it's off the table. In the Dramatically. In the show. Yeah, in the show. It, it would feel anticlimactic to me personally, especially so. when we're getting into all the Greyjoy stuff. Like the, you, you know, like Northern justice on the Iron Islands would feel out of place. I, out I of think we, we need to uh, wrap this up. We're out of time. So thank you, everyone, for coming. Thank you so much for being here. Thank you for liking Theon. Yay!